Hello everyone, it's Plagan here, and today we're going to be discussing the Fall 2020 um, anime season. I always actually forget if it's the Fall one or like the um, like winter one around this time of year, but I'm pretty sure it's Fall since we're in October. So anyway, um, I am not going to review all of them because they're not all appealing to me. There's some that are like, I think there's like some Digimon or like... Um, Zoid ones that are like not up my alley. They're for like kids and stuff, and I'm like, eh, I'm not really into that kind of stuff. Or like other weird ones that I just kind of ignored. So there's a lot more out there that I'm going to cover, but these are the ones that I've watched and uh, am kind of enjoying so far. Some of them I've not, so I'll kind of get to those. Um, but first, there was one that I dropped um, already. Um, I forget the actual name of it. It was like something Siegfried or something like that. It was about um, these girls who had planes and uh, like the world was under attack by these like enemies from like within or something like that. It was, it was weird, like this alien type thing. It was kind of like strike witches, but rather than having strike witch kind of things where they have like planes on their legs, um, they actually flew like airplanes and stuff and it just uh it didn't do much for me it wasn't very memorable um so i kind of just said nah i'm not gonna watch that anyway we're gonna be discussing a number of them so without further ado let's jump in to the first one here if i can do this properly boom ba boom so i think this will change it for y'all so this is akuma drive a, a Kudama drive. Um, anyway, this one, it's kind of weird. I don't really understand. There's only one episode out so far, and I'm not entirely sure what's going on, but I like it. So there's these uh, these people here that you see um, currently on the, the screen here, and they all are apparently like... I forget what their name was. Um... They're a, a group of basically criminals, and they each have, like, bounties of, like, or, like, no, no, it's not bounties that they show. It's years in prison they would get if arrested, and there's, like, competed life sentences, there's, like, 200 years, it's, it's like, insane. And they all have, like, special, like, abilities or quirks or whatnot. The, uh, the guy with the dreads up top, he's really strong and just fucks shit up. The, uh, the girl with the lab coat on the left there, she's a insane doctor and you first see her in the first episode like she's on a train a guy has a heart attack and she performs open heart surgery on him without like any anesthetic or anything and uh ends up killing the rest of the passengers when they try to intervene and stuff um the guy down below on the left he uh, is a courier he moves packages without any question with his uh, motorbike um all that kind of stuff um the guy in the middle is a hacker who's wanted he broke into a bank on his first episode here and um the guy on the right he is apparently like this serial killer who is going to be like executed and uh, the guy up top on the right he's in jail he was in jail he's like a minor character you don't even know much about he uh it says he's a hoodlum is what it is and uh, the girl on the bottom right is a normal citizen who just happened to meet the courier and she uh, went to a stall to get uh, takoyaki, I think it was, and she couldn't pay because they didn't accept, like, credit. They had to pay in cash. And so the woman called the cops on her. She went to the, like, police station where the serial killer guy was being held and this message went out to all these people saying, hey, break them out of prison the uh, guy who's being executed and you'll get like a shit ton of money or whatever um, or like in the guy's case in the upper left it was or test your strength against the whole police department you know that kind of stuff um, and it ends up with the girl on the right saying she uh, I think she said her name was like swindler or something like that um, and she somehow swindled the police department forgetting about her criminal record so she just acts like a normal citizen when in reality she's just bluffing hard and the very last part of the episode ends with, like, these explosive collars being placed around all these people's necks. 
and this cat in the upper right talking to them. And that's how it ends. So it, it seems like it's going to be a kind of, like, action-y, sci-fi, like, getting criminals... I don't know if they're going to fight to the death. I don't know if they're going to go on a crime spree doing stuff for this cat. Or, like, what's going to happen? It's It's got me interested, if nothing else. So that, that's, a, that's a whole thing. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. Um, we're going to move on to the next one now, which is uh, this one. This is called Assault Lily uh, bon Banquet, I think. Something like that. Or like a bouquet. Maybe. Maybe it's bouquet. That looks like the spelling for bouquet. I'm sorry. I can't read well, all right? Anyway, um, this one has Madoka Magica vibes to me, in a, in a way. Um, so it's about these girls who are, like, on the front lines of fighting against these creatures known as the Huge. And they use these, like, oversized, like, weapons, which... Um, uh, remind me of God Eater weapons because they're like huge, oversized. They like turn into like guns and stuff like that too. And uh, it seems to have like a very Yuri vibe to it because the uh, the red haired girl on the left there in the front uh, wants to kind of get after the pink haired main character here. Um, also, right after the first opening scene, it gets a very very nice close-up on the main character, the pink-haired girl's thighs. And honestly, they fucking nailed that. Because it's not just like the stocking, you know, flush with the, the leg, you know. No, it has the little dimple, like the, the, the pinching of the thigh meat that you see um, in real life. And it was like, okay, I'm sold. It's got great animation and whatnot. Um, but yeah, they fight these, like, strange, huge creatures that... Uh, apparently want to destroy humanity and they're located at this uh this centralized academy that is just like if, if they show like a uh, an area of the map or like a an area of the map they show like the topography of the area and they're like there's there's cities to the east and west on the coast but like right in the middle is the academy and right in the middle like the landscape is just fucked like there's caverns and scars from like fighting and stuff like that because they're huge they're drawn to the uh the power that these uh these girls have the lilies as they're called and they will uh try to attack them rather than the surrounding cities which is why um the academy is located where it's at so they can minimize damage to the other areas and whatnot so seems like it's gonna be neat um so far I i'm really really interested to see if it takes a dark turn like Madoka Magica because it seems like it's set up to do that because the black haired character on the the bottom right um so far she seems like she has uh she used to be cheerful in the main characters like past memories when they in chance met each other um but now she's kind of dark and glum and whatnot so it seems like something fucked up happened so either she lost someone close to her or she learned that, you know, the lilies are part of the problem or something. Something weird like that. Like, she uncovered something that's not great, and that just made her kind of withdrawal from society. Um, but anyway, really curious to see how it plays out, because I love myself some dark turns in cute shows. Like Madoka Magic, for example, I said. Um, it's, it's really curious to see how things go. It's going to be interesting if nothing else is going to be a cute show with cute girls in it so i am in um but yeah moving on to the next one we have this one which uh it's not really a show because the episodes appear to be seven minutes long it just came out today as i'm recording this um it's uh dogeza de tono demita i think i pronounced that right um anyway it's these very short clips, like I said, three minutes. Um, and in this three minute clip, the first one I saw, basically the main characters you don't see, it's like a first person's perspective thing. Um, he's asking this girl here in the front, the, the, the reddish pink haired girl, um, he's asking to see her breasts, basically. And she's like, what, no. And it's like, he keeps begging and begging until she finally does it. 
um, over the course of like a couple of minutes is what the the show does. And there's like some narration and stuff going on, and like the back and forth between the main character and her and whatnot. And uh, you don't actually see anything, at least not on the version that I saw. If there is a version that actually shows something, I'm interested to find it because I'm a pervert. But anyway, um, apparently the premise for the show is the main character goes around asking the girls you see here to basically show him something pervy, um, whether it's breasts or panties or whatever the main character basically wants, like, hey, show me your breasts or, hey, show me your panties or give me an upskirt or yada yada, stuff like that, really pervy shit. So I I'm curious... I thought, when I first saw the first episode, I was like, yeah, this is going to be really fucking cringe, and, like, I'm going to, like, not be able to finish it. But being, like, three minutes, I was able to finish it, and it was like, okay, that's kind of dumb. But, I mean, it's, it's three minutes, so it's like, whatever. I'm, I'm curious how the other ones play out. It reminds me of that one um, series that was also really short. Was it about, well, fuck, well, I forget the actual name of it. It was the one where it had the main character asking to see the girl's panties while they lifted up their skirts or whatever it was, while making, like, a disgusted face at the... <laughs> whatever that one was. I never saw that one, but it, this reminded me of that in a way. Anyway, we'll move on quickly past this one and go to this one, which has been pretty great. It reminds me almost of Dugarara in a way. Um, it doesn't have quite the, like, supernatural-esque theme of it, but this is Ikibukuro Westgate Park is what it's known as. It's, uh really neat so it centers around um the main character here in the middle um i, I think his name's makoto uh but it centers around this group of youths who are in ikibukuro um, known as the the d boys which are on the left here and the uh, the red angels on the the right basically they're a, a gang a group of kids and um they're not like a gang as in if you're an American, you would think of them like running drugs and stuff like that. Basically, is they they hang out, they you know do stuff together, they look out for one another because they're all like delinquents and um, they're trying to like make Ikibukuro a, a safe and good place for them to be. So in the first episode, um, King, the guy on the left in the the gray suit, he's the leader of the D Boys. He asks Makoto, who's not kind of part of either of the groups, he's just a friend of King's to fix a situation with this uh, this drug pusher who's new to the neighborhood. Um, and they're pushing drugs that are causing um, people to get into accidents, people to die, yada, yada. And um, it seems that each episode, because there's two out now, and I watched both, it seems each episode switches from, like, one thing to another with, like, a, a kind of common uh, storyline between it that kind of adds up over time. Um, so the first one, he was, like, uncovering this drug group to like get them shut down and he uh like kind of worked with uh the d-boys and the police to kind of get them shut down um so and then the second episode it's basically about this corporation who mistreats their uh their employees and getting them shut down or getting them you know to give better conditions to their employees who are also um there's some d-boys who are employees of this group along with the red angels and stuff like that um so it seems like a really interesting kind of concept it's apparently based on a series of urban mystery novels so it's kind of like a crime drama mystery type thing almost but it uh it's been great so far i'm really looking for more more of it because like i said it reminds me of Dudara. Do da ra ra, but without the uh, whole uh, sci-fi element stuff like that. Um, good animation, good like fighting and stuff when it does come up. Um, pretty great, yeah. All in all, then we're gonna keep watching that one. The next one, so far, is one of my favorites. This is I'm standing on a million lives or a hundred man. No. Inochi no ue ni ore wa tateiru. Um, long ass names. Um, anyway, the main character on the left here, he doesn't really know what he wants to do. He's in middle school, he's about to go to high school. Um, he doesn't really know what he wants to do with his life. And so he's just kind of like this whole 
city sucks. I hate this city. Um, all of a sudden, he gets transported into a, another world one afternoon. And he meets with this uh, this girl here in the witch costume and this girl here in the warrior outfit. And they're his classmates. And they're given a, uh, a quest to do in this uh, kind of fantasy world. So the, the outside the glass here represents like the like, fantasy world area. And the inside is his normal life and whatnot. So they're transported to this new world. And they have a quest to fulfill this village chief's order. And you find out that um, after each quest they complete, a new person is added to the, the group, essentially. So I started out with the mage here. She basically had to... Uh, fuck, I think she... She had to do something really simple, like wander around or something. Like, or survive, like, a day. I, I forget exactly what it was. It was something very simple that she just had to, like, hide and deal with. Um, the second one, they had to, like, discover two villages... And that's when she came up here. And then the third one, they had to, like, fulfill the village chief's order. So they kind of progressively get harder and harder over time. And that's why more people are added each time. Um, so far, two episodes in, they still have just the three. They just finished their first actual quest. And so what happens is they get transported to this world. And then when they finish the thing, they get transported back to the real world with no time having passed in the real world. However days or however long could have passed in this fantasy world. So after completing each mission or what have you, they get to ask this like godlike creature in the upper right who's missing his head a question. And they asked like, uh, the first girl asked who brought us here, and it was like, someone you know was the answer. And the other one was like, why are we here? And I forget the, the answer to that one. And I'm not going to give away what the third question was, because that's the main character of one that happened at episode two. But he asked something, and it was, like, kind of fucked up, the answer. So the first episode really had me, because at the end of it, he uh, basically goes off on his own, and he's like, I'm just going to fucking level up, because fuck, I don't want to die. <laughs> because apparently if everyone dies in the, the the game world we'll call it they die for real but if you die one at a time you can be brought back you'll just automatically resurrect after uh, 30 seconds where you had died um, unless of course if you were to resurrect you would be killed immediately um, so like if you were drowning and you drowned and you would be resurrected um, in 30 seconds and you were still underwater you would drown so it just does not revive you so they could recover your corpse bring it on land, for example, and you could revive there. Um, that doesn't actually happen in the show yet. I don't know if it could, but that's just one example that they gave um, about how that kind of worked. Uh, but the, the main character seems like it could go either way with like him being a hero or like an anti-hero where he just wants to throw away the real world and live out his life in the, the, the game world because he's kind of had it with that. But... There's also apparently quests that the Game Master gives you to fill in the main world. And I'm not going to get into what those are. We don't know what the main character was given, or how they're given, or anything like that yet. So, I'm interested to see how it plays out. But, if anything, to go off of the last two episodes from it, it's been pretty great. It's, uh, it's not exactly Isekai, since they go back. It's kind of like... They're playing a game temporarily, and then they leave and come back, that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm real curious to see how it plays out and how it goes. Uh, so check it out if that sounds like something up your alley. Moving on to the next one. The third season of Is It Wrong to Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon? Oh, boy. So if you've seen the last two seasons, you kind of know the premise and everything for um, this one. So I'm not going to cover too much on this. Basically, the first episode starts out with Bell and his party. They, uh, they're in the dungeon, and they find this, uh, this monster girl who uh, apparently has sentience. And she's talking, and she was crying, and Bell saves her. And then they smuggle her up to the surface, and they try to figure out more about why these monsters are sentient and talking. Because they used to think all monsters were like 
bad and evil, but if they can be reasoned with and if they can like live in harmony with people, why are we, you know, slaughtering them? And uh, this this uh, monster girl who I think they named Winnie, uh, she like really is attached to Belle and whatnot. She's really cheerful and normal. Um, so it's kind of interesting. So it's got a, an air of mystery to it about what is causing these monsters to gain sentience. Have they always had sentience like this? Or what is kind of going on in the dungeon right now? That's so far what I've gotten from it. And because they don't like monsters, no one in the area likes monsters, if they're figured out, shit goes to hell. So they have to like be secretive about it and kind of do a little bit of like subterfuge roguery to like figure out information. They can't be like, hey y'all, we found a monster that's like intelligent. Here she is. Like anyone know why I get any ideas about this? Yada yada, you know? So I'm curious to see how it plays out. And uh we'll just kinda go from there. Yeah. So next one, it's uh Jujutsu Kaisen. It uh it appears to be a sort of supernatural hunt for artifacts kind of fighting show <laughs> I, I don't really know how to, to do it justice anyway this main character here in the middle um, he's a really talented like athletic kid he doesn't like play in like athlete uh, athletics or anything like that he doesn't play any sports um, but he's like really strong and his body is sturdy and he's part of an occult club um, just kind of for the hell of it and whatnot um, but he's like really overpowered like, in terms of strength and whatnot. He's not the sharpest tool in the shed, though. Um, so anyway, the thing starts out with, you know, just basically showing you how much of a monster this guy's strength is and uh, all this kind of stuff. And his grandfather ends up dying in the first episode. And can I just say, they, they did that really nicely, the way that his grandfather died, because, like, you'd only met the guy for maybe a couple of minutes, and... I personally was like tearing up a little bit when it, when his grandfather finally passed, and his grandfather's last like wish to him, or like what what he passed on before he passed on, was make sure you save as many people as you can. You know, don't be like me and end up in a hospital surrounded by no one, you know, just alone, dying, you know that kind of stuff. Um, so we kind of took that to heart and. This uh, this guy on the left here, he was tracking down an artifact at their school and uh, ends up getting associated with this guy. And so all hell kind of breaks loose as the occult club members, excluding the main character, like have this, uh, this artifact that they're like doing stuff with at night. And it unleashes uh, this like curse, essentially. And um, the guy on the left... Up here, he fights the curse, tries to, you know, do stuff, and tells the main character to just kind of wait back there because he's not, you know, able to deal with curses and stuff like that because he's not been trained. He's a normal human in the guy's eyes. Uh, the main character kind of, like, revisits his grandfather's words and is like, you know what, fuck it. If my friends are in danger, I got to go help them. So he goes in, basically beats the shit out of the, the, the curse with his bare hands, um, as best as he can, because he can't really do much damage to it, um, and whatnot. And it ends up with him swallowing the cursed item, uh, and now a demon possesses him. But he, like, apparently has so much strength and, like, fortitude and whatnot that he can unleash the demon whenever he wants and take control whenever he wants. Um, so the whole premise is now, since he did that, they have to get, like, these... I think there's like 12 total fingers or no, there's like 20 fingers or something um, that they have to go and collect from this one demon who's like hella strong and since he has become possessed by it his choices are to be executed immediately or collect and eat all the fingers and then be executed so that the, the curse of these fingers will be uh, negated when he dies so he's like well, fuck, I guess I'll just join you guys and uh, help as many people as possible 
and yada yada. So it, it starts out like that, and with him going through, he uh, he goes to like their uh, their base of operations and starts to kind of learn about the uh, the occult and stuff like that. So it's going to be kind of a supernatural hunting down these cursed fingers kind of show. Seems very interesting. The uh, the animation, the artwork, uh, the action scenes, pretty good. I think it's going to be great. So check that out. On to the next one, which is Kamisama Ninata Hi. So I honestly don't know exactly what this show is going to be. Um, it centers around the guy up top here in the middle. He is an average Joe, pretty much, and he randomly meets this uh, this girl in the middle who uh, claims to be Odin, one of the gods. And she gives a prophecy that, hey, the world is going to end in 30 days. Yep. And so she's on Earth, and she basically like tags along with this guy to like experience the world I suppose and she tries to help him do stuff because she's taken a liking to him so um, the, the first thing is like he he likes this girl here who's like a childhood friend or something and she tries to help him get with them but it, it's kind of a comedy weird thing like that but I feel like it's gonna be more than just like a comedy romance type show especially with the world ending in 30 days so it's probably gonna be um, a, a story like the guy and the girl who uh, is the god are like trying to figure out how to prevent the end of the world you know something like that I'm not entirely sure it's kind of hard to describe um, it seems like an interesting show it's got some funny parts to it I'm definitely gonna keep watching it at least for a couple more episodes it hasn't really gripped me and like got me like I'm 100% in yet but he's got some cute characters so i'll keep watching for a little bit if it doesn't grip me by like episode four i'll probably drop it but so far so good yeah that's all i gotta say on that one not too much about it on to the next one which is this one it's uh by the grace of the gods or kamitachi ni hiro wareta otoku so it's about this kid in the middle here and it's an isekai, in a way. So this guy from the real world, he's like a middle-aged um, office worker, basically works himself to death, essentially, is the premise. And then these gods up the top here, um, in order to siphon magic from Earth to their world, send him and open up like a portal to send him to this place. So he's reincarnated in like this, uh, this like eight-year-old boy, and he's got like magical powers and the world has magic in it and yada yada. So... He decides to basically raise slimes. So he has like these thousands of slimes, all with like different abilities and stuff that he like um, uses and whatnot throughout his daily life. Like one of them cleans stuff, one of them um, makes fertilizer, one of them has sticky like substances that it can give away. One's, one's a poison slime. Um, there's that kind of stuff going on. Um, he raises them and kind of trains them and all that kind of stuff. And then he meets one day some soldiers who he helps because they got injured by like a bear or something I think it was and then they return like a little while later with the like lord of a land or something like that and they're going on a journey and then they take him with him essentially um, to kind of go on a quest because he seems to have fallen for this blonde haired girl it seems I'm not entirely sure but anyway it seems to be um, kind of like a slice of life where it's him going around doing things with the slimes kind of showing what he has learned and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it seems great. It seems like such a simple, like, show, such a simple premise. But honestly, it's really, to me, it's been a nice show to watch so far. There's two episodes out for it so far as of the recording of this video. I think it comes out every Sunday is when it's coming out. So far, I've liked it. It's been funny. It's been interesting to see like him interact with these slimes and people and whatnot. So I'm definitely looking forward to more of that. It's gonna be kind of interesting. Definitely looking forward to that one. Definitely will watch it to completion. Um, so check it out. On to the next one, 
King's Raid, um, Successor of the Will, or King's Raid, um, Ishiwo Sugumono Tachi. Um, this one's weird to me. Um, it seems like, at least from the first episode, there was this war that occurred, and there's like demons, and the demons have been like pretty much beaten back, but they're kind of like resurfacing, and there's these dark elves who are hated, who want to like seize control of the human world and stuff like that, and the main character is one of those goody-goody, like, I want to protect everyone, heroes, and I'm hoping it takes a dark turn, and he gets put in his place and realizes real quick that he can't fucking protect everyone and he needs to get good. Um, so far, I'm not impressed. It's got okay artwork. It's not the best I've seen. The, uh, the priest lady here in the kind of middle with, like, the green headband and stuff, she's nicely stacked, so... She has good character design. Um, the main character, though, he's really bland. Like, if you've seen one show about a hero who, like, wants to protect everything, who's a goody-goody two-shoes, you've probably seen this hero. Uh, you've probably seen this main character. And he is more than likely the reason I will drop this show. The other characters, the setting, everything else seems okay. But if the main character, so help me God, keeps being like, I have to protect everyone, it's my duty, I want to be a knight, I'm going to be a goody-goody two-shoes, I'm going to have to drop it. Like, I just can't. I, I, I'm so tired of the generic hero nonsense. Like, if it's a hero thing, but they're like an anti-hero, or there's like dark turns to stuff, but if it's like... I'm a hero and I want to protect everyone kind of thing. It just kind of gets bland and gross. I've seen too many of those to really deal with much. But so far there's two episodes out. I've only seen the first one. Um, the first one, he's basically this uh, this knight in training. Um, he has a friend who is a full-fledged knight who he's training under. And then... There's uh, dark forces seen outside the capital walls, or the castle walls anyway, so in this forest. So his friend and some other knights go out to scout the area, determine what's wrong. They're ambushed, they're basically slaughtered, and the hero's like, I gotta go save my friend, because I'm a hero. And basically the, the end um, is him and the priestess lady, who are all friends with the, the one guy who's outside who got ambushed. Um, are like, we're going to leave, go find our friend, and see if we can help, stuff like that. Meanwhile, the Dark Elves, um, there's like this, uh, this counselor guy, or this like lord or something, who's part of the king's, uh, like inner council, who's like, hey, we can hire these Dark Elves to help us, uh, beat back the monsters and whatnot, and everyone else is like, we hate Dark Elves, fuck you! And you can tell... The main guy, or the, the main, uh, the person who's suggesting the Dark Elves, um, is, like, shady, because he looks shady. He looks like a bad guy. You know, the Dark Elves themselves, only the main guy on the right here looks kind of shady. The rest of them, they look like they're normal, like, people. Like, the, uh, the girl here looks kind of cute and normal. Um, but the guy, the, the Dark Elf guy here definitely looks shady. Definitely looks like a, a bad guy. Um, everyone else seems like they might just be kind of along for the ride on things, is what it seems like. So it seems like they have very clear heroes and villains. And I don't necessarily like when there's clear heroes and villains. I like when there's some, like, middle gray area. Like, oh, the villain was only bad because um, they were trying to, you know, save their people or something like that, which... Apparently the excuse for the, the Dark Elves being bad is that um, they were just mistreated previously. Even though now I think they have their own, like, place and they're still kind of being racist. They're still, like, they're still prejudiced against the Dark Elves and stuff like that and whatnot. But, like, I don't know. The Dark Elves' whole goal is, like, we're going to rule the human world and put them under our feet and yada yada, that kind of stuff. So, clearly... 
Very bad stuff. Although, looking at the uh, the cover here now, and I, I think I missed this, that looks like a mech in the background, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Like, huh. I'm curious if that's actually a mech. If it is a mech, and it shows up here in the next few episodes, I'll be in. I'll be watching it. But if it's just going to be a hero, I'm a hero kind of show, I'm going to have to drop it. I, I don't know. It so far has not appealed to me very much. I'll give it a couple of episodes, but like, meh. Anyway, on to the next one. It's the, uh, the second season of a regular at Magical High School. Um, I actually forgot most of what happened at the first uh, season, because it's been so damn long. Um, but apparently this, this blonde slash redheaded girl here is sent to, uh, Japan to, uh, investigate who the world-class threat magician is, which is the main character, um, because he had, like, fucked up, like, the Korean Peninsula water area or something? I don't know. I forget exactly what happened in the last season, but anyway... Um, so they kind of meet up, and she's kind of going undercover in school, because she's of that age to be in school. And there's, as of episode two, like kind of a third party that's happening, um, that's kind of like draining people's blood and killing them because they're magical, so they're like doing some shady stuff. So it seems like it's going to be about these two groups here, the main character and the, the blonde-haired girl, um, kind of learning they can trust each other and then also figuring out what this group is that's known as the vampires who are going around killing magicians and draining them of blood and yada yada that kind of stuff um, still great like animation compared to the last one probably going to keep watching it even if I don't exactly remember what's going on um, but it should kind of kick in here after uh, a couple of episodes I'd say anyway that's all that one. Don't have much to talk about when it comes to season twos on stuff. So next we're going to talk about The Wandering Witch, The Journey of Elena, or Majo no Tabitabi. So, I got to say right now, this is also one of the great ones that's been here um, this season. Uh, I love it. Simply because it's like a witch just exploring. Um, so... It starts out with this girl, Elena. She wants to be a witch because she wants to, like, kind of wander the world and uh, explore and whatnot. So at the age of, like, 14, she passes being the, the youngest to pass the witch apprentice program. Um, and then she has to find a, a master, a uh, full-fledged witch to kind of guide her and then finally say, okay, you're a full-fledged witch, and then she can graduate to that. Um, so she wanders around, can't find a witch that wants to take her in because she uh, either, it turns out later her parents kind of bribed the, the main, her teacher to actually take her in. So either the other witches didn't want her because she was extraordinarily powerful or because her parents were like, hey, don't fucking teach our girl, okay? We want her to fucking stay with us, okay? You know? Um... So we're not sure exactly why they kind of turned her away at that point. Um, but anyway, so this other witch um, takes her in. It's the witch of Stardust or something like that. I forget exactly what her name is. But um, basically, she treats Elena like shit in the beginning. Like, basically as a servant. Like, she makes her meals. She goes to fetch, like, materials for potions and stuff like that. Doesn't teach her jack shit. And this goes on for, I think, like six months or something like that. And then finally, Elena has basically had enough of it and is just like, okay, this is going to be my life now and has basically lost all enthusiasm of, like, being able to learn magic. She's just stopped asking about it. And the other witch that took her in it feels kind of sorry about it and it's like, fine, let's go uh, learn some magic. So they go out to a field and... The, uh, the older witch, the witch of Stardust, is like, okay, I'm going to attack you. Withstand my attacks. And Elena's like, huh? And so there just ensues this magical battle, which 
is fucking great, by the way. It's like, if it didn't have me before, it snagged me with that, like, combat and spell casting and all that kind of stuff that happened there. It was great. So, basically, the Witch of Stardust beats the shit out of Elena, because, of course, Elena's still a newbie and doesn't have that great of uh, skills yet. Um, and Elena ends up crying... And the Witch of Stardust, like, kind of comforts her and, you know, confesses that, yeah, your parents gave me, like, a shit ton of gold to kind of make your life hard and make you realize that you're not special so that, you know, you have a reality check now and not, like, later and whatnot because they didn't want you to actually go out and wander the world. And finally gives her um, the... Uh, She's like, okay, we'll train you and whatnot. And a couple years pass, and uh, she finally gets her uh, graduation, and she becomes the, oh, fuck. It's the witch of, uh, I don't remember. Oh, my God. It's like Ash or something like that, but it's not, um, it's not Ash. It's like, I feel like it's Ash and Hair. But it's not. It was named. She gave. Okay. So the Witch of Stardust gave her this name because of her, like, white ashen hair. I don't remember exactly what her name was, though. Her, her witch name, anyway. Um, but anyway. So she goes back to her parents and is like, hey, I'm leaving. And her dad's like, no, don't leave. And all that kind of stuff. And her mom's like, okay, I understand. But just make sure you stay safe and, you know, visit us when you can and whatnot. And so she leaves on her journey. And at the very end of the first episode, she says, we've grown up, she's 18 now, and she's starting her journey to wander the world, and uh, wander the world she does. So uh, in the second episode, she goes to a uh, city, runs into this uh, also not quite an apprentice witch, this witch in training, who's trying to get to become an apprentice witch, and they kind of have a, a story thing that goes through. I'm not going to spoil much about it, but anyway, so it seems to be... Her going around meeting other witches or doing other things, and it's just a normal, comfy, slice-of-life fantasy comedy thing. I don't know. It's got me. I'm interested in it, so it's going to be nice. I'm always looking forward to more of that, too. On to the next one. Um, The Sleepy Princess in the Demon Castle. Or as I like to call it, Sleepy Princess for short. Um, so it's about this princess who, right off the bat... She gets kidnapped by the Demon King um, because he wants to, like, take over and stop the peace between the humans and the demons that's been happening. And so th there's this hero who's like, I gotta save the princess. But none of that matters. None of that is what we're talking about. It might be brought up a couple minutes in an episode or so, but none of it matters. What matters is the sleepy princess. So she's kidnapped, right, in this demon castle. So what does she do? Does she cower in a corner in her jail cell? Does she cry out in woe and agony? No. She sleeps. And she gets woken up and wakes up with frizzled hair or creases on her skin from the blankets being a little bit too rough. Or her crown leaving a crease on her forehead. So she takes matters into her own hands. She decides she's going to get a fluffy pillow. She's going to get nice silken sheets. She's going to take her crown and make a softer, better one. She's going to find a comfier bed. She's going to get a sleeping potion to make herself sleep better. She's going to get a, a bug net to make sure mosquitoes don't get her into bed um, while she's sleeping because the demon castle jail cell is open air. Um, it's not like closed off to the elements in the outside world. So that's the kind of story that it is. It's not like a completely linear story. It's about the princess trying to make it more comfortable for her to sleep. And that, that's kind of how it goes. So it's, it's just like some, like she has a mission and she like fulfills it. There might be another mission in the, uh, the episode. It might be a couple of missions that she does. Like the first episode was get a pillow, get a better blanket, get a, uh, uh, fuck. 
something to block out the noise of snoring uh, monsters while they're sleeping and whatnot. So that seems to be what happens. She just kind of goes around, tries to find better ways to sleep. It's really all it is. It's just a nice, cute slice of life. It's all it really is. And she just goes by the d demons without worrying about anything. She's like, I'm just going to sneak around the demon lord castle. And then, like, the demon lord comes to confront her after, like, she escapes her prison time and time again and just sees her sleeping peacefully. And he's like, well, I can't yell at her now. And just, like, leaves. <laughs> it's like, it's great. Just check it out. If you're looking for something really comfy and... These little, like, uh, teddy bear demons are just great because she uh, basically bribed them with uh, brushing their hair. And that's actually what's in her pillow to make it nice and fluffy is their, uh, their like, spare hair that she combed off. Um, and so anytime she wants to leave, she just bangs her brush against her jail bars. And the two teddy bears just come flying down with the keys to the jail. She'll brush them and then take the keys and leave while they just kind of sleep blissfully on her bed after being uh, combed or brushed or whatever. <laughs> it's really adorable. Definitely check it out if you're looking for something comfy this season. On to the next one. Oh boy. Whew. So this one is Talentless Nana or uh, Muno Na Nana. So I oof, I don't I'm not even sure where to begin on this one because I've seen two episodes but I can only I'm only going to talk about the first one because the second one oh my fucking god it opens up a new door so it's a, a kind of drama psychological horror um, thriller supernatural shit so let's just let's just talk about what happens in the first episode so it centers around this main character who appears to be talentless. Um, all of these kids that you see here in this, uh, this, this screenshot or this uh, cover photo for it, whatever. Anyway, they're all gifted with supernatural powers. And they're on this deserted island training their skills to fight against the enemy of humanity. The enemy of humanity... They, they come in various forms. They're, they're monsters, allegedly, that uh, take on any form. They destroy humanity. They kill thousands, if not millions, of people. And so their job is to hone their skills and get better, get stronger, find a way to come together and destroy the enemy of humanity. And that's what they do. Basically, they're in a school setting. They uh, confront each other like this uh, fire guy on the right and this ice guy kind of in the middle. Um, they're at each other's throats, fire and ice fighting, you know, that kind of stuff. They all have their kind of abilities. Some of them keep their abilities secret. Some of them, like the fire and ice guy, are very brazen about it, like, hey, we can do this. The main character, this, uh, this guy here on the right, kind of average-looking dude, he kind of keeps his under wraps as well. He, uh, he doesn't have really good strength. Doesn't have much going on for him, but he really wants to lead the fight against the enemy of humanity, you know? He wants to be the leader of this group of people and whatnot. So that's essentially what uh, he tries to do. Um, and then this new girl, this, this pink-haired girl, I think her name is Hiragi, I think? Hold on, let me, uh, I want to I wanna make sure I get her name right. So it's uh, Muno na 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 Let's see. Ba, 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 ba. So anyway, yeah, so actually, I just fucking realized Nana is the girl, the pink-haired girl. It's uh, Nana Hiragi is her name, and uh, she's the main character, not the guy. So, fuck me. Okay, y'all, I'm going to stop talking about this show, because, listen... The next couple of minutes are going to be spoilers for this show from episode two, okay? And the end of episode one. If you do not want to hear the spoilers for this, mute it now, and you can unmute 
when we switch over to the next one, so when the next picture here comes up, um, feel free to unmute. I'm going to give you guys a couple of seconds to do it because I need to fucking tell you all about this because it is, oh boy. All right. Are you done? Okay. So this girl, Nana Higuragi, she is talentless. She has no abilities. Even though she says she can read minds, she's really just a fucking amazing detective. She can detect things. She can read body language and stuff to determine what people are actually thinking, what they're doing. She can get subjective, like, hints from objects and stuff that people deal with. And her goal, she is the one who is killing the enemies of humanity. Because the enemies of humanity, they're not monsters. They're these children. These children with supernatural abilities. They're the monsters of humanity. And that's revealed in episode fucking two. So, her goal is to kill off each and every one of these motherfuckers who has supernatural powers without getting caught. Because each one of them can kill millions of people. So she starts off with this kid here, whose name I forget, because he's not the main character. Oh, oh, oh no, the first episode has you. It has you thinking. But she pushes him off a cliff on the first episode. He dies. Yep. And he's just, bye-bye. She plays it off. They're not too worried. He was always kind of a background character in a way. This, uh, this white-haired guy here, though, he's a little suspicious. He transferred in at the same time, too. He's like, hey, that guy just kind of disappeared after becoming leader so badly he wanted to become leader, you know, what the fuck's going on? And so it seems to be a kind of drama between him and Nana trying to uh, kind of counterplay each other. At least so far. It's not been, like, basically set up like that. Anyway, second episode, she kills this guy who has the power to go back in time. And uh, so I think each episode is going to basically be her killing someone or getting them kind of erased from the area. It's going to be interesting. I don't know how many more twists and turns there will be but going from the first episode where it's like oh that's weird is, is she the enemy of humanity is she the one who they're all trying to fight against because she's the bad guy but then episode two comes around and reveals that her job was to kill the enemies of humanity who aren't actually real it's just these supernatural ability people called talent uh, talented and to do it secretly and that's her goal, is to kill them. So she is the main character. She is the hero. They are the enemies. And it's like, bruh. So I'm real excited to see how it plays out, where it goes, all that kind of stuff. Oh, boy. So those are the spoilers for that one. On to the next episode, the next thing. All right. I'm going to give you all a couple seconds to unmute. Are you unmuted now? Perfect. Our next show is called Noblesse. It is weird. Kind of odd. I'm not entirely sure what's going on. But it centers around this group of people here. Mainly the, uh, the black-haired guy here, the gray-haired guy on the left, and the red-haired guy on the uh, for far left up there. Uh, so in this world that it takes place in, it's a supernatural world, and... There's humanity, there's uh, the kind of mutated humans that uh, this organization called the Union is trying to, like, create super soldiers, basically. And the first opening scene is, like, the, the Union just, like, massacring, like, normal-ass troops and stuff. Like, just destroying them, utterly and completely. Um, and then it cuts to a normal school with this uh, this normal human, the red-haired guy, um, and this black-haired guy that they attend and whatnot. Um, but it turns out that the, the black-haired guy is this... Uh, I'm just going to call him fucking vampires, because that's what it reminds me of. The black-haired guy is basically a vampire. Um, they're superhuman. Uh, they have super strength. They're amazing. They're great. And uh, he hires this, uh, this former union person, the gray-haired guy on the left, um, to basically guard the school that he attends and whatnot. Um, 
and you, you kind of find out that the the union is after these like super natural super powerful beings that are called nobles or the noblesse essentially um which are like the the main black haired guy here um and so it's kind of like this this supernatural mystery cat and mouse game between the union and the nobles trying to uh fight each other and whatnot and basically i'll do they, they, they do it uh, in school um with this like red-haired kid who's a normal human and uh whatnot while trying to be like very quiet about things like it seemed like the black-haired kid he just wants to like observe humanity and uh kind of see how things are going kind of have like a normal life almost it seems he's very quiet you don't hear much from him he's one of those cold and stoic characters the uh yeah it, it seems interesting um it's definitely gonna have a lot of action because there's a lot of fighting in it um in the first episode uh the the red-haired kid he uh he does this one part where he uh grabs this woman's arm who almost falls from a curb while trying to cross the street and apparently she just like falls in love with him from that point and her boyfriend doesn't like it and her boyfriend's like this huge like fucking muscle bound gangster guy so him and his friends during this first episode they they drive into the school onto the uh like track area and basically harass some students until the red-haired kid shows up and uh like <laughs> All for making, all for the girl, like, falling for him and whatnot, which is hilarious. Uh, and then the gray-haired guy, who is one of the mutated humans, who uh, was former Union, kind of uh, serving the, the black-haired guy now, um, is hired as a guard to the school. And he very apprehensively, he doesn't want to make a spectacle of himself because he doesn't want the Union to know where he's at. So until like the black haired guy just kind of stares him down for a while uh he doesn't do anything about this while the red haired kid's getting his ass beat by the guy um he finally goes out and just like grabs the big guy's face with one hand and the big guy tries to fight back but he can't even budge the gray haired guy and so the gray haired guy just fucking like throws him back into a car and just like fucks up the entire front end of it and whispers in the guy's ears you're lucky there's people around or i would have killed you <laughs> and it's like fuck so they bail and it seems like it's gonna be an interesting show i don't know i, I just like talking about the kind of stuff that happens but so that's kind of what it seems like there's uh a few groups vying for power um with the, the nobles kind of trying to protect humanity humanity being its own thing um, the Union trying to, I'm guessing they're trying to, like, abduct the nobles to, like, research them to make super soldiers and stuff. I don't know. Seems seems like that's kind of the premise. So I'm interested to see where it goes. It's over there. The next one, the uh, it's, it's called Kimito Boku no Saigo no Seijo. Um, I am Aruwa Sekai ga... Hajimaru Sensen, or Our Last Crusade, or The Rise of the World. Um, my fucking god. <laughs> Can animes not have long-ass names like this, please? Anyway, these are the two main characters that you see here in front of you. It's uh, the girl named Alice, and the guy named Iska. They are parts of... Well, Iska's part of the Empire, and the girl named Alice is part of um, another country and whatnot, and they're basically fighting each other because the Empire doesn't like witches, and the other faction, like, hoards witches, or it's like the sanctuary of witches, essentially. And, uh, they're both soldiers. The, uh, Alice is a princess from the one country, and Iska is a soldier from the Empire, and... They're destined to kind of fight each other. It reminds me kind of of a Romeo and Juliet scenario. They're on opposite sides, but they end up kind of loving each other. And in episode one, you kind of see 
when they kind of fight each other and they kind of realize that each other, they're, they're not actually bad people because they both want to put a stop to the fighting. So it seems like what's happening is they're going to kind of like fall in love. And so far, two episodes in, it seems like that's what's happening. They're like kind of encountering each other and learning more about each other. And they basically like the same things. They're basically the same person, just, you know, male and female is what it seems like to me if, if we had to go. Like, they're two parts of a whole, essentially. Um, and so it seems like they're going to end up talking to each other. Like, hey, let's stop this war. And they're going to take on both sides. Or they're going to, like, turn against one side and help the other side. Or something like that. It, it's interesting. Interesting. So the first episode, really combat heavy, a lot of fighting, a lot of action. Second episode was more slice of life, kind of romancy, fantasy-ish stuff, you know. So I'm interested to see where it goes. Um, a lot, or a number of people that I've seen talk about it, equated to, oh, it's another Kirito and Asuna thing from like kind of sword art. Um, doesn't seem exactly like that to me like it seems more like a Romeo and Juliet type story than a Kirito and Asuna, Asuna um, type story you know so I'm curious to see how it all shakes out and goes um, good animation cute stuff good stuff I'm interested to see where it goes like I said over and over again all right let's go on to the next one honestly also one of my favorites of the season. It's uh, Tonikaku Kawaii, or uh, Tonikawa Over the Moon for You, is what it's also called. Um, it's a romance, comedy, slice of life, and apparently a sci-fi. So, I'm two episodes in, and the first episode, it starts off with this kid named NASA. He uh, is uh, on his high school entrance exams, I believe, is when the time period starts. And he's very, like, studious. He's intelligent. I think he's, like, number one in the region of Japan for, like, um, the placement exams and stuff like that. And his, his whole goal is to be better than NASA because his parents named him NASA after the North American Space Association. And he's like, I'm going to be fucking better than them because everyone fucking laughs when they hear my name. They're like, ha, oh, you're going to be an astronaut, right? And he's like, fuck that. So that's why he's been working diligently from his childhood up until now. And he is walking down the street, kind of like reading a book, um, minding his own business. And he looks over and sees our heroine, the uh, Tsukasa girl is her name. And he sees her, and it's immediately love at first sight. He's like, holy fuck, this girl is beautiful. And he starts stumbling across the road to try and, like, talk to her. But all of a sudden, here comes Truck Coon. And he basically gets hit by a truck. Um, but you find out that um, Tsukasa actually jumps in front of the truck, taking most of the damage herself. And um, Nasa is lying on the ground, like, bleeding out. Tsukasa stands over him with, like, a little bit of blood on her head, but not much damage otherwise. And she's like, she says something. And then she starts walking away. And Nasa has that um, uh, feeling that if he doesn't go after her right now, he's never going to see her again. And so like the driver of the truck is like hey dude i'll call an ambulance stay right there don't move and nasa's like no i'm fine getting up and he like chases over the chases after the girl despite like bleeding heavily and whatnot um and he meets her he follows her to like a bus station or a bus stop or something and he's like hey i'm fine i i don't really know what to say you know that kind of stuff um and she's like, you should sit down. Your legs are broken. Because <laughs> apparently this motherfucker ran after her with broken legs. 
and she's like, I'll go get the an ambulance for you, and gives him like a handkerchief, and she looks completely fine, by the way, after this, and she starts to leave the, uh, the bus stop to like, go get him help, uh, is what it seems like, but once again, he has one of those like, fuck, if I, I, if I let her go, I'm never gonna see her again things, and chases out of the booth after her again, and she's like, dude, seriously, your, your legs are broken, you're going to die if you keep coming after, like, if you keep moving, and he's like, I can't, I like, I love you, go out with me, and um, he basically asks her out there and then, but she's like, I'll go out with you on one condition if you marry me, and without hesitation, Ness is like, yes, I'll marry you, and then passes out from blood loss. He wakes up in the hospital, no sign of Tsukasa, nothing like that, and for the next couple of years, until he turns 18, basically, he uh, never sees her again. So he, he basically quits his like plan to go to like college and whatnot. He starts working at a convenience store because it's trafficked by a lot of people daily, hoping to find her again, hoping to see her and whatnot, and eventually one day, he all of a sudden hears a knock on his door and there she is there's Sukasa, and she's bringing with her a marriage certificate that he has to sign so they can get married and he's like just overwhelmed he's like uh 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 yeah i'll sign it yeah i love you it's great and he keeps commenting it's the fucking cutest thing in the world he's like god damn it she's so cute and it's like uh so good um so anyway he signs a certificate. They walk together in the middle of the night to the, uh, I think that's like a, a clerk's office or something like that, turn in the marriage registration, and basically get married there and then. And then they, uh, they, they, they hold hands for the first time on the first episode, and <laughs> it like becomes a running thing, like an all-you-can-grab, because um, they're married is what he, he says out loud when he grabs her hand for the first time. And it, it's just adorable. And so he's like, oh, God, I can't fucking believe we're married. What the hell? He, like, has conflicting feelings because he's like, she's so cute, and she loves him, or and, and he loves her. But he's like, did we really just get married? I don't. It's, it's so crazy. Um, and so they kind of walk towards his apartment, but she says she has to go do something. And he gets, like, really concerned because he's, like, she just disappeared for, like, years. And this is the friend I saw her again. And he's, like, he like he's, like, wait. And she's, like, don't worry. I'll be right back. We're married, right? And so he, like, feels a lot better and just goes home. And then kind of sits on his bed, kind of, like, thinking out loud and talking to himself. And, like, doing weird, like stuff about like I only have one bed it's really small how are we gonna sleep together like oh my god there's not enough room and he's like going through all these mathematical calculations about the average human is like x like wide so there's like just not enough room if they both lay shoulder to shoulder but what if I use her like a uh, a hugging pillow and like like that yeah that'd be enough room all the while apparently talking out loud and she had knocked on the door but he didn't answer, so she just came in and heard, like, all this rambling and stuff. And uh, it's just so adorable. It's, like, just so so fucking adorable, y'all. I just want you to all know it's, it's so adorable. But uh, I don't know. It, it's almost too good to be true, you know? Like, she disappears... She got hit by a fucking truck. Took the brunt of the damage, by the way. The guy in the truck told him, so... Like... She was in front of him, got hit by the truck, and he was the one who, like, had his legs broken, was in the hospital, and she was, like, fine. She just walked away. Um, so she's either, like, an alien? Or, like, some sort of, like, superhuman? Or something weird like that. Or, like, a god, maybe? But... I don't know. There's a fucking sci-fi tag on this on this uh the show for a genre and i'm like what the fuck is the sci-fi part what is she because we know nothing about this girl we know that uh nasa is a normal kid who is really studious and whatnot but other than Sukasa being really cute 
We know nothing about her. Massa knows nothing about her. He just saw her and was like, fuck, she's really cute. And, like, he keeps glancing over at her and is like, oh, my God, she's really cute. And, like, there, there's one part where she puts her hair up before they go to bed. And he's like, oh, my God, my wife even looks cute with her hair up. And it's like, he just keeps doting on her. And I, I absolutely love it, y'all. It's so cool. It's so great. I cannot wait to see more of the show. And to figure out what is going on with Tsukasa. Because I'm so intrigued. I need to know more about her. Right? Also, I just want to fucking say... I absolutely love the fact... Now, there doesn't assume, seem, seem to be a drama tag on this fucking show. Because nothing sucks more than watching a romance show where, like, the main character and the heroine get really close and they're, like, almost dov lovey-dovey. And then the story involve, like introduces a new character who, like, starts to take away the heroine's affection from the main character. And it's like, no, you... Bastards! What are you doing? Like, there was no drama until that point. And they just added it to, like, we gotta make a climax that's dramatic and yada yada. And it's like, motherfuckers, you absolute fucking bastards. Stop it. Just let them have happiness. I hate drama. I hate unnecessary drama. Like, if it's a little bit of drama, like, if, um, let's say they're in a school setting and there's, you know, a couple of guys and a couple of girls in the story and they're all kind of like there's drama about who's gonna go out with who and you know what's going on with what and whatnot that's fine that's okay what's not okay is having a clear-cut main character a clear-cut heroine with like no no like competition between them at all and them clearly liking each other and then throwing a fucking wrench into that in the last couple of episodes Ugh. I forget what I forget which anime it was that really pissed me off with that. Like everything was good until like the last I think episode eleven or ten or something. And then I saw this new character get introduced, which just pissed me off. And so I was like Nope. So I skipped like I like skipped that episode, looked at the next one. That new character was still there. Skipped the next one. New character was still there. Skipped to the final episode. Skipped like halfway into that one. And then that's when the main character and the heroine actually started to like get back together. And like inevitably I think started dating or something. Actually I don't think they actually fucking started dating. I think they just were like yeah so let's continue our will they won't they thing. Which just... But they resolved, like, the, the conflict with that fucking stupid third person, which was just fucking unnecessary, and I fucking hate it. Ugh. Alright, that's enough to ramble on about that. The last and final one we're talking about today is Moriarty the Patriot, or Yukoko, Yukoku no Moriarty. So, it's, uh, it's kind of in the same world as Sherlock Holmes and whatnot, the same time period there. And it centers around this guy, this blonde-haired motherfucker, named William James Moriarty. So it's got the, the mystery and psychological elements that Sherlock Holmes normally has. However, it's about Moriarty, which, if you know the Sherlock Holmes stuff, Moriarty, I believe, is the, like, criminal mastermind that... Sherlock Holmes um, uh, goes, like, against. Like, they're at odds with. Um, but in this particular one, so I'm just going to read the synopsis because I'm not going to be able to do this justice. So, in the 19th century, the British Empire nobility reigns while its working class suffers at their hands. Sympathetic to their plight, William James Moriarty wants to topple it all. Frustrated by the systematic in, uh, inequality, Moriarty strategizes to fix the entire nation. Not even consulting Detective Sherlock Holmes can stand in his way. It's time for crime to revolutionize the world. 
So it, it seems like he's going to be doing crimes, and we're going to be following him doing crimes. But the first episode wasn't about crime. It was about... It almost felt like we were watching Sherlock Holmes because Moriarty was... Uh, so there was this uh, serial killer who's been going around and killing young boys. And Moriarty basically looks at all these unconnected people and whatnot. And he looks at what their father's professions were. And they all do things where nobles would have been able to see the children. Like, one of them was a, a tailor's son, so the son would have been working in the shop. One of them was a, a, a clocksmith's um, son, so, like, for pocket watches and stuff, or a jeweler's son, I think. And uh, so the, the son would have been being an apprentice to them. Um, one of them was a stable boy helping out in his father's stable. One of them was a... Uh, a, uh, fuck, I forget what they called it. Um, uh, a messenger boy, I want to say. So he, like, delivered messages to people. Um, so Moriarty was like, it's a noble. And the one that seemed to be the most odd and did not fit the system was this orphan boy who uh, had played the accordion in, like, the center of this, uh, this plaza thing, kind of almost. And... So Moriarty goes there, kind of looks around, and sees, in perfect view of the plaza, there's this one window of this one building, which apparently, after some asking around and whatnot, belongs to um, a noble club. And so he joins the club, him being a noble himself, and he basically finds out who sits in that chair regularly. And in order to confirm his suspicions, he goes and talks to the guy and is like, Ah, I see you have fine taste in suits. Do you go to, you know, the the guy whose son was killed shop? And the guy's like, oh, yes, I frequent them. <laughs> Most astute observation, yada, yada. And then he, Moriarty keeps listing off the, uh, the places that he probably attends where the children have died. And uh, the guy gets more and more flustered. And Moriarty reads his face and is like, ah, so I know what you're doing. And then leaves. And so uh, the guy has one of his henchmen who he was using to like abduct the young boys kind of follow Moriarty. Moriarty. And Moriarty goes into this, uh, this dead-end alleyway and they basically knock the guy out, the, the, the one guy out, the servant guy for the noble, and get him to talk and admit that the noble is the one who does it. And so they grab the noble and take him to the place, the same exact place where he killed all the children before dumping their bodies and the so it was kind of like a consulting thing that Sherlock Holmes does where someone comes to them asking for help um, one of the boys fathers had came to Moriarty for help and so the guys the kid's father wanted revenge and so Moriarty takes the guy to the noble who is like in this like I think it's like a cemetery uh, crypt kind of like that and uh, basically gives the guy a knife or a pair of scissors, I think, because he was a tailor, and basically shuts the door, goes to have a smoke, and you can hear, like, screaming and blood and stuff like that happening off screen, and then the, uh, the tailor walks outside, just his hand and, like, face covered in blood, and the guy just having been stabbed to death in the, uh, the uh, catacomb, and Moriarty just shuts the door, and that is how the first episode ends. So... It, it it felt like, yeah, sure, Moriarty helped that guy commit a crime by killing the noble, but he also, like, solved the crime of the, the child murderer, right? That's what it seems like. I'm definitely looking forward to more of this. The first episode came out 11 days ago, so I'm not actually sure when the rest of the season comes out. Like, when the next episode comes out, because usually it's every seven days, right? So I'm, I'm keeping an eye on that one. I'm not exactly sure when, though. So, those are the ones that I've been watching this season. Like I said, there's plenty more of them. There's just a bunch more that is out there for you to you know, peruse if you're interested. If you've liked any of these, you know, feel free to check them out. Um, I'm not going to tell you the place I watch them at, 
But you can probably catch most of them on Crunchyroll or the ones that are on like Funimation. You can get them on Funimation, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and kind of go from there. So if you've liked any of those, check them out. That'll be all for me, everyone. So until next time, have a lovely day. Bye-bye.